Section 15 of Toto's Merry Winter by Laura E. Richards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter 13, Part 2. Green Jacket Continued. Eileen stared at the man, thinking he'd gone mad, for his face was red and his eyes, from which he had snatched the green spectacles, glittered with a strange light. The same idea flashed into his wife's mind, and she crossed herself devoutly, exclaiming, "'Holy St. Patrick! He's clean demented! King, indeed! Will ye hear him?' The doctor turned on her sharply. "'Demented!' he said. "'You'll soon see if I'm demented. I tell you, I'll be king of Ireland before the month's out. Speak now, Eileen. Open your mouth, Alanna, and make your manners to Miss Shaughnessy.' Thus adjured, Eileen dropped a curtsy, and said timidly, "'Good day to you, ma'am. I hope you're well.' Hop, plop! Down dropped a pearl and a diamond, and the doctor, pouncing on them, held them up in triumph before the eyes of his astonished wife. "'Did you see that?' he cried. "'That's a diamond. There's no sitch in Queen Victoria's crown this day. And look at that. That's a pearl, and as big as a marrow-fat pay. The like of it's not in Ireland, I tell you. Woman, there's a fortune in every word this Colleen speaks. And she's going to speak, he added grimly, and to keep on speaking till Michael O'Shaughnessy is rich enough to buy all Ireland. Aye, and England too, if he has a mind to. But, but, cried Mrs. O'Shaughnessy, utterly bewildered by her husband's wild talk, and by the sight of the jewels, what does it all mean? Has the child swallowed them? And won't she die of them? "'if there's that many in her stomach?' Whisht, "'Wisht with your foolery,' said her husband contemptuously. "'Swallowed him, indeed. "'The girl has met a green man. "'That's the truth of it. "'And he'd give her a wish, and she got it. "'And now I've got her.' "'And he chuckled and rubbed his bony hands together "'while his eyes twinkled with greed. "'A green man? "'The saints be good to us,' cried Mrs. O'Shaughnessy. "'Sure you're always telling me there's no such thing.' "'I lied, then,' shouted the doctor. "'I lied, and that's all there is to say about it. "'Do you think I'm obliged to speak the truth every day of the week "'to an ignorant creature like yourself? "'It's worn out I'd be, body and soul, at that rate. "'Now, Eileen McCarthy,' he continued, "'turning to his unhappy little prisoner, "'you're to do as I tell you, and no harm'll come to you, "'and maybe good. "'You're to sit in this room and talk. "'And you'll keep on talking till the room is full up, do you hear me now?' "'Full up?' exclaimed Eileen faintly. "'Full up!' repeated the doctor. "'No less'll satisfy me, and it's the least you can do for all the trouble I've taken for ye. "'Mistress O'Shaughnessy and meself will take turns sitting with ye, so that you'll have someone to talk to. "'You'll have plenty to eat and to drink, and that's more than many people have in Ireland today. "'So let me hear no complaining.' "'And with this,' The worthy man proceeded to give strict injunctions to his wife to keep the child talking, and not to leave her alone for an instant, and finally he departed, shutting the door behind him and leaving the captive and her jailer alone together. Mrs. O'Shaughnessy immediately poured forth a flood of questions, to which Eileen replied by telling the whole pitiful story from beginning to end. It was a relief to be able to speak at last, and to rehearse the whole matter to the understanding if not sympathetic ears. Mrs. O'Shaughnessy listened and looked, looked and listened, with open mouth and staring eyes. With her eyes shut, she would not have believed her ears, but the double evidence was too much for her. The diamonds and pearls kept on falling, falling, fast and faster. They filled Eileen's lap, they skipped away over the floor, while the doctor's wife pursued them with frantic eagerness. Each diamond was clear and radiant as a drop of dew, each pearl lustrous and perfect, but they gave no pleasure now to the fairy-gifted child. She could only think of the task that lay before her, to fill this great empty room, of the millions and millions and yet millions of gems that must fall from her lips before the floor would be covered even a few inches deep, of the weeks and months, perhaps years, that must elapse before she would see her parents and Phelim again. She remembered the words of the fairy, A day may come when you will wish with all your heart to have the charm removed. And then, like a flash, 
came the recollection of those other words. When that day comes, come to this spot, and do so and so. In fancy, Eileen was transported again to the pleasant green forest, was looking at the green man as he sat on the toadstool, and begging him to take away this fatal gift, which had already, in one day, brought her so much misery. Harshly on her revere broke in the voice of Mrs. O'Shaughnessy, asking, "'And has your father sold his pigs yet?' She started, and came back to the doleful world of reality. But ever as she answered the woman's questions, she made in her heart a firm resolve. Somehow or other, somehow, she would escape. She would get out of this hateful house, away from these greedy, grasping people. She would manage somehow to find her way to the wood, and then, then for freedom again. Cheered by her own resolution, she answered the woman composedly, and went into a detailed account of the birth, rearing, and selling of the pigs, which so fascinated her auditor that she was surprised, when the recital was over, to find that it was nearly supper-time. The doctor now entered, and taking his wife's place, began to ply Eily with questions, and one artfully calculated to bring forth the longest possible reply. How is it your mother is related to the countess's old housekeeper? And why is it with such a grand relations she never got into the castle at all? What was that I heard the other day about the lucky bargain your father, honest man, made with the one-eyed peddler from beyond Iniskin? And is it true that your mother makes all her butter out of skim milk just by making the sign of the cross, God bless it, over the churn? Although she did not like the doctor, Eily did, as she had said to the green man, love to talk. So she chattered away, explaining and disclaiming, while the diamonds and pearls flew like hailstones from her lips, and her host and jailer sat watching them with looks of greedy rapture. Eily paused, fairly out of breath, just as Mrs. O'Shaughnessy entered, bringing her rather scanty supper. There was quite a pile of jewels in her lap and about her feet, while a good many had rolled to a distance. But her heart sank within her, as she compared the result of three hours' steady talking with the end to which the rapacious doctor aspired. She was allowed to eat her supper in peace, but no sooner was it finished than the questioning began again, and it was not until ten o'clock had struck that the exhausted child was allowed to lay her head down on the rude bed which Mrs. O'Shaughnessy had hastily made up for her. The next day was a weary one for poor Eily. From morning till night she was obliged to talk incessantly, with only a brief space allowed for her meals. The doctor and his wife mounted guard by turns, each asking questions, until, to the child's fancy, they seemed like nothing but living interrogation points. All day long, no matter what she was talking about, the potato crop, or the black hen that the fox stole, or Phelim's measles, her mind was fixed on one idea, that of escaping from her prison. If only some fortunate chance could call them both out of the room at once. But alas, that never happened. There was always a pair of greedy eyes fixed on her, and on the now hated jewels which dropped in an endless stream from her lips, always a harsh voice in her ear, rousing her if she paused for an instant by new questions as stupid as they were long. Once, indeed, the child stopped short, and declared that she could not and would not talk any more. But she was speedily shown the end of a birch rod, with the hint that the doctor would be loath to use the likes of it on Dennis McCarthy's child, but her parents had given him charge to drive out the witchcraft, be hook or by crook. And if a birch rod wasn't the first cousin to a crook, what was it at all? And Eily was forced to find her powers of speech again. By nightfall of this day, the room was ankle-deep in pearls and diamonds. A wonderful sight it was when the moon looked in at the window, and shone on the lustrous and glittering heaps which Mrs. O'Shaughnessy piled up with her broom. The woman was fairly frightened at the sight of so much treasure, and she crossed herself many times as she lay down on the mat beside Eileen's truckle-bed, muttering to herself, "'Michael knows best, I suppose. But sorrow of me if I can feel as if there was a blessing in it.' The third day came and was already half over, when an urgent summons came for Dr. O'Shaughnessy. 
one of his richest patrons had fallen from his horse and broken his leg, and the doctor must come on the instant. The doctor grumbled and swore, but there was no help for it, so he departed after making his wife vow by all the saints in turn that she would not leave Eileen's side for an instant until he returned. When Eileen heard the rattle of the gig and the sound of the pony's feet, and knew that the most formidable of her jailers had actually gone, her heart beat so loud for joy that she feared its throbbing would be heard. Now, at last, a loophole seemed to open for her. She had a plan already in her head, and now was a chance for her to carry it out. But an Irish girl of ten has shrewdness beyond her years, and no gleam of expression appeared in Eileen's face as she spoke to Mrs. O'Shaughnessy, who had been standing by the window to watch her husband's departure, and who now returned to her seat. "'We'll be missin' the doctor this day, ma'am, won't we?' she said. "'He's so agreeable, ain't he now?' "'He is that,' replied Mrs. O'Shaughnessy, with something of a sigh. "'He's real agreeable, Michael is, when he wants to be,' she added. "'Yes, I'll miss him more nor common to-day, for tis worn out I am entirely with sleepin' so little these two nights past. "'Sure, I can't sleep with them things a-sparklin' and a-glowin' at me the way they do.' "'and now I'll not get me nap at all this afternoon, "'being I must stay here and keep you talkin' "'till the doctor comes back. "'Me headaches, too, mortal bad.' "'Do it now,' said Eily, soothingly. "'Ah, oh, that's too bad entirely. "'Will I tell you a little story "'that me grandmother had for the headache?' "'A story for the headache?' said Mrs. O'Shaughnessy. "'What do you mean by that, I'm askin' ye?' "'I don't know rightly how it is.' replied Eily innocently. But Granny used to call this story a cure for the headache, and maybe you'll find it so. And anyhow, it'll keep me talking, she added meekly, for tis mortal long. Go on with it, then, said Mrs. Shaughnessy, settling herself more comfortably in her chair. I love a long story, to be sure. Go on with ye. And Eily began as follows, speaking in a clear, low monotone. Once upon a time there lived an old, old woman, and her name was Moira Magoli, and she lived in an old, old house, in an old, old lane that led through the old, old wood to the side of an old, old stream that flowed through an old, old street in an old, old town in an old, old county. And this old, old woman, sure enough, she had an old, old cat, with a white nose, and she had an old, old dog with a black tail, and she had an old, old hen with one eye, and she had an old, old cock with one leg, and she had... Mrs. O'Shaughnessy yawned and stirred uneasily on her seat. Seems to me there's mighty little going on in this story, she said, taking up her knitting, which she had dropped in her lap. I like something a little bit more lovely, I'm thinking if I have my choice. Just wait, ma'am, said Eily with quiet confidence. Only wait till I come to the part about the two robbers and the keg of gunpowder, and it's lovely enough you'll find. I must tell it the way that Granny did, else it'll do no good. Well then, I was saying to you, ma'am, this old woman, St. Bridget be good to her, she had an old, old cow, and she had an old, old sheep, and she had an old, old kitchen with an old, old chair and an old, old table and, and an old, old pantry with an old, old chum and an old, old saucepan and an old, old gridiron and an old, old... Mrs. Shaughnessy's knitting dropped again, and her head fell forward on her breast. Eileen's voice grew lower and softer, but still she went on, rising at the same time and moving quietly, stealthily toward the door. And she had an old, old kittle, and she had an old, old pot with an old, old lid, and she had an old, old jug, and an old, old platter, and an old, old teapot. Eily's hand was on the door, her eyes fixed on the motionless form of her jailer. Her voice went on and on, its soft monotone now accompanied by another sound, that of heavy, regular breathing, 
which was fast deepening into a snore. And she had an old, old spoon, and an old, old fork, and an old, old knife, and an old, old cup, and an old, old bowl, and an old, old, old... The door is open. The story is done. Two little feet go speeding down the long passage, across the empty kitchen, out at the back door, and away, away. Wake, Mrs. Shaughnessy, wake. The story is done, and the bird is flown. Surely it was the next thing to flying, the way in which Eily sped across the meadows, far from the hated scene of her imprisonment. The bare brown feet seemed scarcely to touch the ground. The brown locks streamed out on the wind. The little blue apron fluttered wildly, like a banner of victory. On, 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 with panting bosom and with parted lips, with many a backward glance to see if any one were following. On went the little maid, over field and fell, through moss and through mire, till at last, oh, happy blessed sight, the dark forest rose before her, and she knew that she was saved. Quite at the other end of the wood lay the spot she was seeking, but she knew the way well, and on she went, but more carefully now, parting the branches so that she broke no living twig, and treading cautiously, lest she should crush the lady-fern, which the green men love. How beautiful the ferns were, uncurling their silver-green fronds, and spreading their slender arms abroad. How sweetly the birds were singing! How pleasant, how kind, how friendly was everything in the sweet green wood! And here at last was the oak tree, and at the foot of it there stood the yellow toadstool, looking as if it did not care about anything or anybody, which in truth it did not. Breathless with haste and eagerness, Eileen tapped the toadstool three times with a bit of holly, saying softly, Slaniger, Banniger, Skeen na lane. And lo and behold, there sat the green man, just as if he had been there all the time, fanning himself with his scarlet cap, and looking at her with a comical twinkle in his sharp little eyes. Well, Eily, he said, is it back so soon ye are? Well, well, I'm not surprised. And how do you like your gift? Oh, your honor's reverence, grace, I mean, cried poor Eily, bursting into tears. Have you'll please to take it away. Sure it's near kilt I am, along with it, and, and no pleasure or comfort at all in it at all. Take it away, your honor, take it away, and I'll bless you all me days. And with many sobs, she related the experiences of the past three days. As she spoke, diamonds and pearls still fell in showers from her lips, and half unconsciously she held up her apron to catch them as they fell, so that by the time she had finished her story she had more than a quart of splendid gems, each as big as the biggest kind of pea. The green man smiled, but not unkindly, at the recital of Eileen's woes. "'Faith, it's a hard time you've had me, maiden, and no mistake.' But now tis all over. Hold fast the jewels ye have there, for they're the last ye'll get. He touched her lips with his cap and said, Kabula coo, the charm is off. Eily drew a long breath of relief, and the fairy added, The truth is, Eily, the times are past for fairy gifts of this kind. Few people believe in the green men now at all, and fewer still ever see them. Why, you're the first mortal child I've spoken to for a matter of two hundred years, and I think you'll be the last I ever speak to. Fairy gifts are very pretty things in a story, but they're not convenient at the present time, as ye see for yourself. There's one thing I'd like to say to ye, however, he added more seriously, and ye'll take it as a little lesson-like, me dear, before we part. Ye asked me for diamonds and pearls, and I gave them to ye, and now you've seen the worth of that kind for yourself. But there's jewels and jewels in the world, and if you choose, Eily, ye can still speak pearls and diamonds, and no harm to yourself or anybody. How is your honor meaning? asked Eily, wondering. Sure I don't understand your honor at all. Likely not, said the little man, but it's now I'm telling ye. 
Every gentle and loving word you speak, child, is a pearl, and every kind deed done to them as needs kindness is a diamond, brighter than all those shining stones in your apron. Ye'll grow up a rich woman, Eily, with the treasure ye have there, but it might as well all be frogs and toads, if with it you had not the loving heart and the helping hand that will make a good woman of ye, and happy folk of your neighbors. And now, good-bye, Mavarine, and the blessing of the green men go with ye, and stay with ye, your life long. Good-bye, your honor, cried Eily gratefully. The saints reward your honor's grace for all your kindness to a poor silly colleen like me. Oh, but one minute, your honor, she cried, as she saw the little man about to put on his cap. Will Dr. O'Shaughnessy be king of Ireland? Sure it's the wicked king he'd make entirely. Don't let him, please, your honor. Green Jacket laughed long and heartily. Ho, 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 he cried. King, is it? Nothing less would suit him, sure enough. Have no fears, Eily. Dr. O'Shaughnessy has come into his kingdom by this time, and I wish him joy of it. With these words he clapped his scarlet cap on his head and vanished like the snuff of a candle. Now, just about this time, Dr. Michael O'Shaughnessy was dismounting from his gig at his own back door, after a long and weary drive. He thought little, however, about his bodily fatigue, for his heart was full of joy and triumph, his mind absorbed in dreams of glory. He could not even contain his thoughts, but broke out into words as he unharnessed the rusty old pony. And when I come to the palace, I'll knock three times with the knocker, or maybe there'll be a bell, like the sheriff's house, bad luck to him, at Kilmagore. And the gossoon will open the door and, What's your errand? says he. It's Queen Victory I'm wantin', says I, and ye'll tell her that King Michael of Ireland is askin' for her, I says. Then, when Victory hears that, she'll come runnin' down herself to bid me welcome, and she'll take me up to the best room and sit down on the throne, King Michael, says she. The other chairs aren't good enough for the likes of you, says she. After ye, ma'am, says I, minding me manners. And is there anything I can do for you today, King Michael? says she, when we've sat down at the throne. And I says, light and easy-like, as if I didn't care. Nothing in life, ma'am, I'm obliged to ye, without ye'd lend me the loan of your Sunday crown, says I, by way of a pattern, says I. And says she, but at this moment the royal meditations were rudely broken in upon by a wild shriek which resounded from the house. The door was flung violently open, and Mrs. O'Shaughnessy rushed out like a madwoman. "'She's gone!' she cried wildly. "'The Colleen's gone, and me never stirring from her side. Oh, where, where, what'll I do? It must be the witches that have taken her clean up the chimney!' Dr. O'Shaughnessy stood for a moment, transfixed, glaring with speechless rage at the unhappy woman. Then rushing suddenly at her, he seized and shook her till her teeth chattered together. "'Ye've been asleep!' he yelled beside himself with rage and disappointment. "'Ye've fell asleep and leaved her slip out. "'Sorrow seize ye! "'You're always the black bean in me porridge!' "'Then flinging her from him, he cried, "'I don't care! "'I'll be it! "'I'll be king with what's in there now!' "'And dashed into the house. "'He paused before the door of the best room, "'lately poor Eily's prison, "'to draw breath and to collect his thoughts.' The door was closed, and from within, hark, what was that sound? Something was stirring, surely. Oh, joy! Was his wife mistaken? Waking suddenly from her nap, had she failed to see the girl, who had perhaps been sleeping too? At all events, the jewels were in there, in shining heaps on the floor, as he had last seen them, with thousands more covering the floor in every direction, a king's ransom in half a handful of them. He would be king yet, even if the girl were gone. Cautiously, he opened the door and looked in, his eyes glistening, his mouth fairly watering at the thought of all the splendor which would meet his glance. What did Dr. O'Shaughnessy see? Oh, horror! Oh, dismay! Terror! Anguish! What did he see? Captive was there none, 
yet the room was not empty. Jewels were there none, yet the floor was covered, covered with living creatures, toads, snakes, newts, all hideous and unclean reptiles that hop or creep or wriggle. And as the wretched man stared with open mouth and glaring eyeballs, oh, horror, they were all hopping, creeping, wriggling towards the open door, towards him. With a yell, beside which his wife's had been a whisper, O'Shaughnessy turned and fled, but after him, through the door, down the passage and out of the house, came hopping, creeping, wriggling his myriad pursuers. Fly, King Michael! Stretch your long legs and run like a hunted hare over hill and dale, over moss and moor. They are close behind you. They are catching at your heels. They come from every side, surrounding you. Fly, King O'Shaughnessy, but you cannot escape. The green men are hunting you, if you could but know it, in sport and in revenge. And three times they will chase you round County Kerry, for thrice three days, till at last they suffer you to drop exhausted in a bog, and vanish from your sight. And Eily? Eily went home with her apron full of pearls and diamonds, to tell her story again, and this time to be believed. And she grew up a good woman, and a rich woman, and she married the young Count of Kilmoggan, and spoke diamonds and pearls all her life long. At least her husband said she did, and he ought to know. End of section 15